GitHub has released their new AI coding tool called Spark. In this video, we're going to take a look at it together. I'm going to walk you through what it is and why I think it's really good. Let's take a look. All right, so this is GitHub Spark. It sort of starts off with a prompt here, just like any other AI chat. And, um, you know, you can do anything, create a to-do list. But this isn't very exciting. And so I, I have a sort of a test that I run all these things through, all these different um, build applications with natural language systems like V0 and Lovable. Spark is just like that. And so I have a prompt that I use for that. It's a PRD here that really just defines what the user is supposed to do. And what it de defines is this site here. So this site already exists. I built this with my hands years ago when we were actually writing all the code ourselves. And it just allows you to create lists of links and then you can uh, share these lists of links with folks. So you get one URL that you can then share with other people, right? So dope links here and then we can publish this and then we get a URL, dope links and it's there. And so we just wanna create this application. It's kind of complex, right? It has login in it. Uh, we have to secure things behind login. The user can has private lists and public lists and they can handle all of that. And so it's, it's, it's hard to one shot something like this. And so this is why I use it as a test for these systems. Uh, and so let's actually, if we go back to our product requirements document, let's just grab the raw text here and then we'll just send it while we're taking a look at Spark. So let's just send it. Now, while this is happening, let's come back over here to an instance that I already have, right? So you can see what I've done today. This is the app it built for me. Let's take a look at what it built and then we'll take a look at the tool itself and I'll show you around the UI. So here, here's, the, here's the application and um, you can create a new list. Well, let's call it, uh, let's we'll just call it dope links. Give it a description, the, all the dopest links. And then a custom URL. Let's see here, I'll do dope links. Let's try this. We'll create it. Uh, and it's created successfully, this nice little toast down here at the bottom. Let's put in a URL here. Let's do code.visualstudio.com. Uh, what's another URL? Let's put in, uh, let's try uh, anthropic.com. That's a website. And we'll do like github.com. And you can see that uh, here's the links. And actually, this image should be on the other side. So that's a bug. I'll need to fix that. But we have these drag handles. It was it actually implemented drag and drop for me uh, on request. Now, it didn't do this in one shot. I went back and said, add drag and drop. When I say I said add drag and drop, I literally just said add drag and drop. Let me see if I can find it here. Add drag and drop reordering of the links. Only the owner can do this. That was the prompt. And this is what it gave me. This is really, really nice. I mean, it's very, very impressive. And then if we publish it, it goes live. Now, um, we, can we, we can copy the link here, which we have. One of the problems I always have with these tools, though, is that they're sandboxed. And so this thing isn't, this thing is published, but this version isn't, right? And so I'm kind of stuck in this window. But with Spark, if I open a new tab and paste this in, it will actually, it's forwarded a port and it will connect me back and authenticate me to make sure that it's me. And because it's my project, I get to access this. So it's almost like developing locally. Uh, very cool. I love this feature about Spark because this is the kind of thing you need to do when you're testing. I really do need to fix this, but this is what it looks like. These public pages, nice URLs. It's just really nice. All right, let's see what else we got here. If we go back to our lists, we've got some analytics here at the top. Here's our different lists. We can edit them. Uh, we can, if we go back here, we can delete them. All the different things that a user would need to do. Uh, it also added for me analytics. So if we go to analytics here, here's the analytics. This looks correct to me. We can see the different views and we can even drill into the analytics on a particular one of these and get some more data here. Anyway, I basically just said implement the analytics for this app and it did. Uh, it just sort of one shotted that for me, which is just, again, it's extremely impressive. All right, what else can we do here? I, that's pretty much the site. If we go to the home page, which you actually won't see if you use this, I'll put a URL in so you can use this. You won't see this because it'll sign you right in, but if you sign out, you'll see it. And it did this, it created this image with this. I mean, I like it, I like it. Uh, some nice uh, stats on the front page. These are live. This is coming from the database. We can even explore lists, right? You can go see everyone's list and actually view the list. Again, 
it made all of this itself. This was iterative. I did, you know, kind of go one feature at a time here. So you can see where I did say, you know, implement the explore list functionality. Now exploring the UI a little bit, let's start over here. One of the things about the chat that's quite interesting is that it collapses the con the um, the conversation. Let me show you what I mean. So if we look at this on mobile, which is what this button does, you can see, all right, we get some horizontal scroll. It doesn't look good. So we'll just say uh, on mobile, the nav bar extends off the screen. Uh, we probably need a hamburger. All right. Again, pretty, pretty, pretty sloppy prompting on my part, but it seems to be completely fine with this. Um, and so it's going to go to work. And then as it brings in, uh, as it, as it's streaming the response in from the LLM here, if we expand here, you can see it just kind of goes, but you don't see the running chat, right? It's kind of, it says, let me do this. Then that disappears. Then let me do this. I'm going to try this. And it just all kind of happens right here, which is strange for me because I'm used to seeing the chat, but honestly, at the end, I don't really care. I don't find that I need to see all of the previous chat, which is quite interesting. Um, so it's going to work on this. Now, while it works on this, let's look at some other portions of the UI here. So I'm going to start at the end. I did give it some screenshots of the application at one point and say, please refactor the UI, redesign. Here's kind of what I want it to look like. But I said, do your own take on this. Don't copy it exactly. And so these are just screenshots that I took of the existing application so that it would kind of know, have something to go off of. But you can see my UI doesn't really look like that, right? It is its own take on it. This prompts tab, I'm not exactly sure what this does. Prompts detected in your code will appear here once generated. So again, I'm not exactly sure what these does. Let's come back to this because I, I don't know exactly what's going on there. For the data, we get to see the, the backing database, and I'm not exactly sure what database this is. I'm sure someone has torn this down to take a look, but we can see the, the table here. So we can see the lists. We can view it as JSON. Uh, here's the analytics events. You can see it's actually capturing, um, capturing user agent as well. So it, it just sort of knew what to capture in terms of what we might want to see for analytics, which is pretty fascinating. And then here are the user objects, which is just JSON. Uh, so that's the data, the backing data for this application. It looks like we're still iterating over here. So you can see how this kind of works. You can see the different files as they're coming in. Uh, and in, in speaking of seeing the files, there's sort of different ways that you can work here. Uh, one of the ways is, and let's toggle this off. How do we toggle this? Oh, oh, we have to wait till it's done. So one of the things is these buttons get locked while it's iterating and can't actually do anything here. And these are probably locked too. No, they're not. So the different it has these different modes where you can look at just the preview or you can look at the code. So you can see here it's sort of streaming in and making changes or you can see all three. Uh, and I find this to be pretty nice. This is a really nice way to work. Uh, if you do this, you collapse the sidebar and then you get all of this. These panes don't appear to be resizable to me, so you're kind of stuck in this three column format, but um, I really like the UI. It's a very nice take on what it might look like to build with an agent in a new way. I generally just stay in the preview mode here. All right, so as it's continuing to write some code over here, let's continue poking around and see what else we can find. So the theme here is quite fascinating. When it comes to the theme, you can pick from these different themes. So uh, again, let me, and in fact, I'm going to speed the video up. So we're done. The AI is done. We can actually click on some of these things. I'll be right back. All right, I'm back and it's done. And you can see it created this. It, it's a question mark and it's not, not quite the icon I wanted, but a nice drawer slide out to move between the things on mobile. Okay. So let's go back and, and to where we were. Let's start with the theme here. And let's go from custom theme to uh, let's do Aurora Borealis. Um, and some of these are just beautiful. I think I'm pretty sure this is Shad CN UI, but you can control the corner radius down here. Like if we do this, we're sort of controlling the spacing between things and the border radius. These things will become bigger. 
it's just a really simple, nice way to sort of tweak the UI here. Let's get, let's go down. Candy Shop's a really beautiful one as well. You can see the font changes. It's just really pretty. It looks really, really good. And I feel like the Shad Cian sort of standard look is a is is handled well here with the theming. Not that there's anything wrong with that standard look, which I think is this one, the neutral, I'm going to say. Yeah, that's more like it, uh, except for the gradients on the buttons here. Uh, let's leave it at Candy Shop. Some other things we can do here is we can, for this right here, this element to edit is for the theme. So if you click on this, it takes you into the theme. So like if you're on Iterate and you click this, it takes you to theme. And then you can click here and you can uh, you can prompt from here or you can change this in like a no code, low code kind of way. Right. And so what we could do, you know, if we wanted to get rid of this entire thing, we could go edit the code, which is probably the fastest. Or we could just like select this whole thing here, um, which is a bit tricky. Um, so select them one by one and then we could add, add some kind of prompt here. Like, you know, I don't know, um, make these more compact. I don't actually know what this will do. And again, I'm going to go ahead and stop this because I don't want to watch this thing think because we can't use the app while it's actually working. And then behind our three dots here, we have a couple of interesting things. So first of all, we're not in a repository yet. I haven't actually clicked this button. Let's get certain settings. So the most interesting thing in here is the model. So we've got currently looks like Sonnet 4 and 3.7 and 4 is the default. It's pretty much settings. Here in the create repository, if we click this, I don't actually know what will happen. So it looks like it's going to be created. In a I think this this repo already exists, I believe. So let's like actually see what happens here. I don't feel like this will work. But perhaps it will. I suppose it did because it's gone. Now, if we click here and click open in code space, then it will open it in a code space. And I, I get the feeling that all of this is happening in a code space in Spark because this comes up almost instantly. Like watch how fast this comes up. The container is already up. Uh, it's already ready. There's the project. <laughs> like it's, it's almost instant. So because it's in a code space, we, we should be able to connect to this code space directly from Visual Studio Code. Uh, and it's called Ideal Capybara. So how would we do that? Um, let me pull up VS Code and let's take a look here. So let me pull in this other window. In fact, let me get a new window going so it's a little less busy. We'll pull this in, uh, do a little resizing here with my resize tool for Windows. Yes, one of those exists. All right, so in our sidebar, let's get a remote. I'll crank up the volume for you a little bit. Here's our code spaces. Let's see if it just shows up. So I actually don't see the code space here, which is quite interesting. I would have thought it would have shown up here, but I don't see it. So maybe we can't connect to it like that. But given that it is a repo, we should be able to spin up the code space from the repo and connect that way. If we look at the package JSON here, and let me crank up the volume again for you. We're using Vite and let's scroll down and uh, yeah, it's definitely Shatsy and UI because we have Radix UI here. Uh, Tailwind, I see Tailwind in here. I see Framer Motion. Here is the application itself. Standard uh, sort of React Shatsy and UI if you're familiar with that here. Nothing new there. Uh, here's all the code that's been generated for us. But we didn't come here to write code. We came here to Vibe, so let's get out of that. So we published through a repository, we looked at settings, we opened in a code space. That's pretty much Spark. Uh, it's just highly impressive. Like I'm just amazed at what I was able to build in about an hour based on what I built over here, which took me back some years ago. I think I spent maybe a couple weeks on this. Um, let's go as a final thing and just check and see where our... So we, this is the one that I started at the start of this video. This is where we are. So we can create a new list. Um, so you can say new list. I mean, it's very, right, it's, it's functional already. We can edit it, you know, and it, it, it actually looks a lot like the other one as well already. Uh, and so you can see, yeah, it probably wants a, a prefix. I actually had to fix this on the other one as well. So anyway, not everyone has access to Spark just yet. I think it's just on Pro Plus memberships at the moment, but hopefully coming to more folks. And it's very exciting. 
Uh, I'm gonna publish this so that everyone can use it. Uh, you can see it's published. Let's go ahead and update the live site. I'll grab the link. I'll put it in the video description. I think this is a fascinating tool. You might think like, why do we need another one of these tools? Uh, and my answer would just be because this one is done really, really well. And if I was gonna build an app today, I think I'd start here. Those are my thoughts on GitHub Spark. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching. And as always, happy coding.